When a snowflake is forming in the atmosphere, it's going to experience a set of conditions that dictate its structure. Uh, but these conditions are totally different than those conditions that exist within the snowpack. Uh, and as a result of these differences, when a snowflake falls out of the sky and lands on the ground, uh, it's going to begin to undergo a series of changes to both its structure and its size. And the reason we care about this is because these changes to the grains of snow can ultimately increase or decrease the stability of the snowpack. So with that said, uh, in this video we're going to dive into a little bit of science and talk about what is physically driving these changes to grains of snow within the snowpack. Now when you're looking at the snowpack, you may think you're only looking at water in its frozen or solid form, but in fact the snowpack contains tremendous amounts of liquid and gaseous water. And while the solid components of the snowpack, those grains of snow, are relatively stationary, the liquid and gas is moving throughout it all the time. So let's go ahead and visualize this. Within the snowpack, you have grains of snow, and these grains of snow are made up of water in its solid form, so they're not really moving around a whole lot. But you also have water molecules existing in their gas phase, which we call water vapor. And these molecules are moving all throughout the snowpack. Now, if one of these molecules encounters the surface of a grain of snow, they are going to solidify on that surface. And if enough of these molecules solidify on the surface, they'll actually change the shape of that grain of snow. So, depending on the way that the water vapor is moving throughout the snowpack and coming into contact, with these grains of snow, you're gonna end up with grains that have shapes that are either contributing to stability or undermining stability. And while this all seems pretty complicated, there's two major factors that drive the movement of water vapor within the snowpack. The first is air temperature. So the temperature of the air outside of the snowpack. And the second is the total depth of the snowpack. So I'm going to explain how these two factors, air temperature and snowpack depth, drive the movement of water molecules and change the structure of snow grains. But first, I want you to envision a dance floor. We've got a disco ball and a crowd of people who are boogieing, but they're all crowded together. And as a result, they are smashing into each other. And with each collision, these dancers move further and further away from each other until they are spread out enough that they can boogie without fear of injury. Now, molecules of water behave sort of similarly to those dancers. They're moving around all the time and colliding with each other. So to visualize this, let's imagine a room and one side of the room is warm and one side is cold. Now, warm air can hold more water vapor than cold air, so the molecules are clustered on the warm side of the room. But because they're clustered, they're colliding with each other, and each collision is gonna send that molecule of water further away from its neighbors. And eventually, what you'll end up with is a distribution of water molecules where they're spread out enough to minimize collision. Um, so on net, what you find is a movement of water molecules from warm air to cold air, just like the dancers moving away from each other on the dance floor to prevent collision. So let's go ahead and tie this back into the movement of water vapor within the snowpack, because that's what we really care about. Um, at the base of the snowpack, unless you're playing around on a glacier, you will always find the Earth. And because the Earth emits quite a lot of energy, 
it holds the air just above it at right around freezing or 32 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, and you guys will remember that freezing 32 degrees Fahrenheit is the temperature at which liquid water becomes solid, but it's also the temperature at which solid water becomes liquid. Those two phases are interchanging constantly. So there's a lot of liquid water at the very base of the snowpack just above the earth. Um, and furthermore, because 32 degrees Fahrenheit is relatively warm compared to uh, most wintertime temperatures, you're going to find a lot of water vapor right at the base of the snowpack, especially relative to the rest of the snowpack. So we've established that the very bottom of the snowpack near the earth is relatively warm. Now let's consider a scenario where the atmosphere is colder than 32 degrees Fahrenheit. Just like the dancers on the dance floor, the water vapor at the base of the snowpack is going to want to move away from its neighbors in order to avoid collision. And this is going to create a net movement of those molecules up through the snowpack towards the colder temperatures. On the other hand, if the air temperature is at or above 32 degrees Fahrenheit, you're not going to get that net movement of water vapor up through the snowpack. So just to bring it back, we've addressed the first of the major factors driving the movement of water vapor through the snowpack which is the ambient air temperature. Now we're gonna dive into talking about how the depth of the snowpack can drive the movement of water vapor. So let's go ahead and consider the dancers again. Only instead of imagining them in a small room where they're taking up a third of the dance floor, let's imagine them in a really large warehouse clustered in the corner. Now. Even though the dancers still want to avoid collisions with each other, and each collision between dancers is going to cause them to spread out more and more, by the time they've spread out in such a way that they can avoid collisions with each other, they'll still only be taking up a small fraction of the warehouse. So let's go back to the snowpack. At the base of the snowpack, you have a lot of water vapor because, as we've established before, the base of the snowpack is relatively warm. Now, consider a scenario where it's cold outside. Each collision of water molecules is going to send them moving further and further away from each other. So, you end up with a net movement of molecules from warm to cold. However, with a really thick snowpack, just like with the dancers in the warehouse, in order to avoid collision, the water molecules don't need to spread out through the length of the snowpack, so the net movement is not as significant. On the other hand, with a thinner snowpack, the net movement of molecules from the base of the snowpack up towards that cold ambient air is going to run the entirety of the snowpack. I'm going to wrap up this video, but before I do, I'm going to introduce uh, one piece of vocabulary, and that is the word metamorphism. And what metamorphism refers to is what we've been describing throughout this entire video, which is a change to the structure or the size of a grain of snow as a result of the net movement of water vapor through the snowpack. And as we've established in this video, there are two primary factors that are going to impact that movement. And the first is air temperature, and the second is the depth of the snowpack. In the next few videos, I'm going to talk about some specific types of snow grains that are formed as a result of snow metamorphism, and how those grains can contribute to or undermine stability.